In this video and the next video, we're going to discuss non-determinism in Turing machines. And we're going to discuss uh, the exact definitions for them, for deciding Turing machines, semi-deciding Turing machines, and Turing machines that compute functions. And we're also going to discuss whether or not non-determinism adds power. What I need you to remember for this video is what the definition of a Turing machine is, and how determinism and non-determinism played out with finite state machines and pushdown automata. So, some recap. We talked about non-determinism in finite state machines and found that it added no power. Now, when I'm talking about power, I refer to the ability of a particular model, like a finite state machine, to decide languages. So, adding non-determinism didn't let us handle any languages with a finite state machine that we couldn't, with a deterministic finite state machine. And the, reason, the way we showed that was a proof by construction by uh, with the algorithm NDFSM to DFSM. We showed a way to convert one into the other. We also found that for the pushdown automata, this wasn't true. In fact, we had a set of non-deterministic context-free languages, which was the, the whole set of context-free languages. And we showed that it had a strict subset called the deterministic context-free languages. The question for us is how this plays out when we get to the Turing machines. So we saw that for the, for the question of power, whether or not we can uh, answer, quest answer questions on languages, determinism did not help with finite state machines, but it did help with pushdown automata. We also saw that the time complexity, so how many steps it took, for a non-deterministic Turing machine, uh, sorry, finite state machine versus a deterministic one, there was no change. But we did see that we required more space for a deterministic rather than a non-deterministic finite state machine. We didn't answer these questions when it came to the PDAs. When it comes to the Turing machines, what we will conclude by the end of this video, sorry, not this video, this video and the video following, is that no, um, non-determinism does not add power to the Turing machines. The question of what it does for time and space complexity is open. So the most probably the most famous contemporary computer science problem, P equals NP, is exactly this question. Does non-determinism add uh, reduce the complexity for Turing machines in time and or, and or space? We'll start with the tuple definition for a non-deterministic Turing machine and talk about the one key difference that we have from a deterministic Turing machine. So again, like the deterministic cousin, it is a six tuple uh, with sets of states, input alphabet, tape alphabet, some sort of transition mapping, a start state, and a set of halting states. Now the key difference, just like with the previous models, is the transition relationship. For a deterministic Turing machine, this is obviously a function with only one possible output put for any given input. But in our case, it's simply any relation that's a subset of the Cartesian product that we care about. Now, this is the set of non-halting states and some uh, tape alphabet character. So we're in a state that's not a halting state, and we see under the head a certain tape character. And then the transition relation gives us one of the many finite, one of the finitely many possible combinations of a state to change to, a character to write onto the tape, and a direction to move left or right. Now the key, as far as the determinism question is, is that we didn't have only one option at each point. It wasn't a function, it was a relation. And so what that means is, let's say, that we have some start configuration of a start state and a starting tape configuration. A non-deterministic Turing machine may have the option of doing several things. So in this case, we have one transition where we went to a state Q2. We obviously wrote a hash down on the tape and we moved the tape head to the right. Whereas another option was to move to state Q1 we left a blank on the tape, but we still moved the tape head to the right. And at this second configuration here, we again may have multiple finitely many options. 
So in this case, we stayed in the same state and we moved the tape head to the right and we didn't change what was on the tape. Whereas in this case, we moved to a different state, we changed the A that was under the tape head to a B and we moved the tape head to the left. The questions for us are, what does it mean when we have a non-deterministic Turing machine that decides a language, semi-decides a language, or computes a function? So we've seen what the definition for a non-deterministic Turing machine is, but remember when we talked about a Turing machine for, before, we also came up with definitions for what it machine means for a TM to decide a language or semi-decide a language or compute a function. And we have to modify these definitions once we start considering non-determinism. So first, let's talk about what it means for a machine to, a non-deterministic um, Turing machine to accept or reject a particular string. So assuming we have some input string, we say that the machine accepts that string if and only if at least one path through the machine, one computation, ends up in an accepting state. So this is just like with the finite state machines and the pushdown automata. We said that we could have many possible paths through and lots of them, those could uh, end up in a rejecting configuration. But if at least one path through accepts, then we say that the machine accepted that string. So obviously the converse is that if our machine goes through all of its possible com um, computations and ends up rejecting, then we say that the machine rejects that string. So the machine re rejects if and only if every possible path is a rejecting path. So for the deciding Turing machines, we say that the machine decides a language if and only if for every possible input string, there is a finite number of paths that our machine can follow and if all of those paths halt and the machine only accepts when the string is in the language. So obviously the last two pairs here give us the case that our um, machine also rejects if the string is not in the language because the machine for, a deci for deciding a language is guaranteed to halt. Even if it might be following multiple paths in parallel, it still has to halt on all possible paths and then accept if and only if, it, um, if the machine accepts the string, which means that one of those configurations was accepted. So you might notice that if we looked at just this decision, um, this definition for accepting a string, we didn't cover the case where a computational path just kept looping forever. So in this case, we say that we can't have any of those paths if our machine non-deterministic machine is to decide the language. All of its possible paths have to halt. So before we move on to the other definitions, let's give an example for a deciding non-deterministic Turing machine. So let's say we want this set of strings where um, it's a string made up of um, ones and zeros and it represents a binary number that is a composite number. So the composite numbers being the opposite of a prime number. That means we can write it as the product of two integers. So the way our machine will non-deterministically decide this is it will non-deterministically choose two positive binary numbers that are between the numbers two and the size of the input string here because that, um, that places a limit on um, the possible options for a composite number. And you can think in your in your own time as to why we can use this second constraint here to limit it. But the key reason we choose this constraint is that we now show that the number of possible um, pairs that we have to choose is finite, therefore there is a limit on the number of possible paths that we can be taking with our non-deterministic Turing machine. So the way our Turing machine then does is it rewrites on the tape using semicolons as separators those two values as well as the original value. So it leaves the original value on the tape here and then it writes its two non-deterministically chosen integers on the tape. Then our machine goes through and computes after the first semicolon the, mul the binary string that represents the multiple multiplication of P and Q. Now we know that you, this is easy to do deterministically using a, um, a function, like a, a Turing machine that computes a function. So we, we're happy with this. Then we can compare 
this value, P times Q, with W. And if they're equal, we accept. And if they're not equal, we reject. Now, we're fine with this because if it is possible for W to be written as the product of two integers, then at least one of these non-deterministic paths, non-deterministic options, will result in an accepting configuration. And that's what we said, um, what, what it meant for our Turing machine to uh, non-deterministically decide. Now, the other thing is that we know that this step and this step are trivially guaranteed to halt. And we know that this step is guaranteed to halt because it's just comparing two strings and either accepting and rejecting. So this is not a, a semi-deciding option. Every possible path that we choose is going to halt and either accept and reject. Now, our definition for non-deterministic semi-deciding is just like our definition for uh, deterministic semi-deciding. It was simply that we change the re requirement for it to halt in every case and just say, say that it has to halt and accept if the string is in the language. So more formally, we'll say that a machine semi-decides a language if for every possible input string to that machine, our, um, if the string is in the language, then our machine will yield at least one accepting configuration from the start configuration. And if the string is not in the language, then our machine will not yield any accepting configurations. But it may not halt and reject on every possible path. In this case, it may end up looping forever on strings that are not in the language. So this is the first of two quick examples of non-deterministic semi-deciding Turing machines. So this language will be the strings of made of A's, B's and C's such that there are two of at least one letter. So there's either two A's, two B's or two C's at least. The way our machine will work simply, so remember that our starting configuration is always uh, tape head on the blank to the left of our input string sitting on the, the tape. So in this case, our machine will uh, transition right straight away on that blank. And then it will loop as on whatever um, symbol is on the under the tape, um, as long as it's from the input alphabet, and move right as many times as it wants. This lets it non-deterministically decide when to start checking if there is a particular um, double. Because, because, for instance, if we had the string BAA, -A, that first symbol is not the one that we need to check for a double, it's actually the second. So this first transition lets us move through as many characters as we need to. Then at some point we non-deterministically decide that we are checking for, say, A's. So upon an A, we will move into a new state that says we're looking for another A and we'll move the tape head to the right. Then we will simply move the tape head to the right while ever we see something that is not an A. And then finally, when we see an A, we move over into the accepting state and we don't need to do anything else at that point. And we can see that you can see that the other two paths on this Turing machine are just doing the same thing for different symbols. Now, the reason this is non-deterministic is pretty obvious. Uh, at any point while it's in state Q1, it has to decide whether to move ahead or pick the current symbol, A, B or C, to check for a double. The reason it's semi-deciding is because on each of these transitions on Q2, 3 and 4, the Turing machine, if, it, if that particular path happened to move, so for example, if we had this string BAA and we followed this path into Q3, our Turing machine would then just loop forever. So not every path is guaranteed to halt. We'll give another quick example where we're going to describe the Turing machine just in plain English. Let's imagine we have the language made up of descriptions of Turing machines which halt on at least one string. So we encode the Turing machines like we've talked about before, and then we're talking about Turing machines which can, uh, which when we run them on all of their possible uh, input strings, at least one of those will end up accepting. So let this be a string that describes a Turing machine M. Our machine S, our new non-deterministic semi-deciding uh, machine, will semi-decide this language on a particular input by uh, running on a particular input, non-deterministically picking from one of the strings in the possible inputs and writing it on the tape, 
and then simulating our machine, our machine that we're asking the question about on W, and then accepting. So we can see that the only way uh, forward for this, uh, the only way for our machine to accept is if M halts. And if M does halt on that particular input, then this will accept. But we can see that obviously if M loops forever, if any of the possible uh, input um, machines loops forever on any possible input, then we will have at least one path which runs forever, which is why this doesn't um, decide the language. Now, the reason I've used this particular example here is because later we're going to talk about this problem and similar problems and show that there's no actual way that we can build a deciding Turing machine. So for the previous example, we could have seen a way to make a, a Turing machine which always halted. But in this case, that's not an option for us, and we'll see that later. Now, the last one for us is what we mean by non-deterministic computation of functions. So we say that a machine non-deterministically computes a function, if and only if, for all possible inputs, every computation that we run through on our machine halts, and all of those computations result in the same uh, result on the um, tape, which is the value of the function given that input. So the key question for us was, does this non-determinism help us in terms of the set of all languages that we can handle using Turing machines? So are we able to handle more languages by having non-deterministic rather than deterministic Turing machines? So we saw earlier in lectures that when we asked the same question about multiple tape Turing machines that it didn't actually add any power. We were able to show a, a constructive proof by building a Turing machine which simulated a multi-tape Turing machine and thus that all multi-tape Turing machines just accept the same set of languages that single-tape Turing machines do. In this case, we have the same thing for non-determinism. So like the finite state machines, but unlike the push-down automatas, we have that if we have a Turing machine which non-deterministically decides a language or semi-decides a language or computes a function, then there is a deterministic ver uh, version which semi-decides or decides or computes the same function. The proof is a little bit outside what we teach in this course, but in the next video we're going to give a very brief outline for the first option that we can show a um, deterministic deciding Turing machine that um, decides the same language as any non-deterministic deciding Turing machine. So to summarise, we already knew all these questions, or rather answers, about the finite state machines and the push-down automata, and we asked the same questions about the Turing machines. And in the next video, we're going to give the introduction to the proof of this fact, that non-determinism does not add power to Turing machines. Um, and we won't go through the full proof for everything, but we'll, we'll give a brief outline. The second question is a well-known uh, unanswered question in computer science, and you'll learn more about that if you go on to do algorithms. And you'll know a lot about that if you've already done the algorithms course. But the key thing that you really need to take away from this uh, video, apart from the definitions of what it means, means to non-deterministically decide, semi-decide, or compute a function, is that no, non-determinism does not add power to Turing machines.